In closing meditation of this holy hour will be on the subject of the most amiable, lovable, and human of all biblical characters, Simon Peter. He had two natures. He had the divine nature which he received from the Lord. He had his human nature which he received from his parents. When our Lord first saw him, he said, Your name is Simon. From now on, your name will be Rock. If there is any name that is quite unsuited for Peter, it is the word Rock. Our Lord must have had his tongue in his cheek when he called him a rock. I can remember when I was in the third or fourth grade, there was a boy in class who never took part in any sports. A good wind would have blown him over. We called him Hercules. When our blessed Lord called Peter rock with exactly the same spirit, he was to become a rock. But he was not one. So we priests have two natures. We have the divine nature, which is our vocation. We have the human nature, which is our human inheritance. And as in Simon Peter's life, there was a vacillation between the two. Sometimes the Simon nature is dominant, at another it is the Petrine nature. And so in our own lives, the human asserts itself. Then the divine comes to the forefront. He is therefore the perfect character to help us understand ourselves and our mission. A few light superficial reflections concerning him. When our blessed Lord was driven out of his own hometown and came down to the Galilee district, Peter had just come in from fishing all night, and he had caught nothing. And our blessed Lord asked him if he had caught anything. He said nothing. Our Lord said, throw your nets into the sea. Now, this was a stupid suggestion. It's morning. The sun is up. They're at shore. What does a carpenter know about fishing anyway? According to some texts of the gospel, Simon said, At your word, Master, I will let down a net. He humored the Lord along because he knew nothing about fishing. And then came the great catch of fish, and he called our blessed Lord, Lord, no longer Master, Lord, And then he recognized his own sinfulness. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Our Lord then went to visit Peter's house. Mark tells us that our Lord went into the house. That's all, the house. Well, Mark wrote Peter's gospel. Whenever you want to find out anything bad about Peter, you'll find it in Mark because Peter only told bad things about himself. If you find anything good, it is always followed by something bad. So this is obviously Peter's house. Our Lord goes into the house. Now, Peter's mother-in-law was sick. In those days, there were two kinds of fevers. Little fevers and great fevers. She had a great fever. So she was very sick. Now, wouldn't you think that the very first thing Peter would say to our Lord was, My mother-in-law is sick. Will you go in and bless her? Did he say anything about his mother-in-law? Not a word. The gospel says, They told him. Not Peter. They told him. And our Lord cured the mother-in-law. Do you think that Peter later on denied our Lord because his mother-in-law was cured.
And then the third interesting insight into the man. Peter one day said to our Lord, Well, we followed you. What do we get out of it? Quid ergo erit nobis. And our Lord said what he would get in the future, and then added for this life, persecution. But these are just light sketches. If there was one dominant character about St. Peter, it was that he hated discipline, mortification, and self-denial. In that, he's just like the rest of us. That he couldn't understand. He wanted to lay hold of the immediate and that which is joyful, but not to have anything really crucial in his life. That is evidence, first of all, from the Mount of the Transfiguration. Here our blessed Lord revealed himself in his risen glory. when his face shone as the sun and his garments were as white as snow. I wonder if that was not, in quotes, the natural state of our Lord. If you put an electric light inside of an alabaster vase, it glows. We can see innocence in certain people, especially children. If you put divinity inside of a human nature... It necessarily must be iridescent. Our blessed Lord must always, during his mortal life, have restrained that effulgence. Now it glows. While he is in this state, Moses and Elijah appear. Elijah was taken up into heaven. Moses, the Old Testament says, no man knows his grave. And St. Jude tells us that Satan and Michael fought for the body of Moses. So we do not know what happened to Moses. He could not get into the Holy Land, but he got in now. And what does our Lord talk to them about? His death. His death. Well, Peter all the while is asleep in this trance and then he becomes conscious of the transfiguration and his first thought is, Lord, it's wonderful to be here. Let's capture this glow. This is the kingdom of God. And the gospel said he did not know what he was saying. So our Lord later on took him down the mount where there was the father with the demonic child, and then Peter was to go to still another mountain. And only after climbing that Calvary would he ever understand the glory that came after the transfiguration in Calvary. So Peter did not understand suffering. He did not understand it when he was named the rock. Because as soon as our Lord said he must suffer, Peter said, this shall not be. We will accept your divinity, we will not accept your cross. Peter, therefore, was not inured to the lesson of the crucifixion. But now we follow him into the great moment of his life. Our blessed Lord comes to the Last Supper, and Peter, at the Last Supper, think of it. He says to our Lord, I've got two swords. Our Lord said, enough of that. Just read over John from chapter 13 on and see the sorrows that our Lord had to face when he gathered his loved ones round about him, heckling. Thomas, for example, heckling. 
And tell us you're the way. We don't even know where you're going. Philip, show us the Father. And our Lord said, Philip, Philip, have I been with you all this time? And still you do not understand. And now, Peter with his swords. And when our Lord goes into the garden, he asks the three of them to watch and pray. Three times he comes back, finds them asleep. At this point, we are going to make a study of the fall of Simon and the resurrection of Simon. Every single description of the five steps of a fall is in the gospel. Every step of the resurrection is in the gospel. I think that the Holy Spirit wrote this out in detail as a lesson to us. Because as we now follow Simon, we're going to see five steps by which he fell from the Lord. And they are the five steps by which we fall. The first step, neglect of prayer. Our Lord said, watch and pray, but they slept. Peter slept. No man sleeps who is worried. And they were not worried. Simon was not worried particularly about the agony and the eternal freshness of the wounds of Christ. And we too, we give up prayer. Not very perceptibly. Maybe it's the office that's dropped. And the office of the church's prayer. That breaks off our communion with the entire mystical body. Then the time that we spend in prayer is less. And very often it goes to sleep, that period, as it did in the case of Simon. So that's the first way we begin to fall away from the Lord. The second step, which has been the story of the church in the last few years, the substitution of action for prayer. As Judas leads his band of about 200 down over the book of Kedron, Peter now takes one of his two swords. And as a swordsman, he proves to be an excellent fisherman. But the best that he can do is he swings it wildly as to hack off the ear of the servant of the high priest. And the last miracle that our blessed Lord worked was the restoration of that ear. He gave up prayer, and now he's an activist. Activism is too often purchased at the cost of the neglect of prayer. We know we should pray, and we're not. So we begin to be extra active about many things that gives us an excuse for not praying. And that activism can sometimes run in the direction of violence. We begin to choose our enemies. And when our blessed Lord said, put back that sword into its scabbard, he was saying to the modern priest, put down that dynamite. That's not the way my kingdom is furthered. If you prayed, you would not be this kind of an activist. The third step in the fall. The gospel said 
Peter followed the Lord far off. When our Lord is arrested, carried over the book of Kedron, and then up the hill of Jerusalem, John is probably with him, as we learn later on in the courtroom of Rannus and Caiaphas. But the gospel singles out Peter. He followed the Lord far off. We still have our eyes on Christ. He's our silent partner. We know that we belong to him, but he's in a distance. We're much more interested in political and economic and psychological sermons. And Christ we bring in incidentally. We're dragging our feet. He makes too many demands. It's a bit dangerous, we discover, to follow Christ too closely. And that's the third step in the fall of a priest. And you can always judge the spirituality of anyone who belongs to the Lord by his attitude toward the Lord. If his heart is full of the Lord, he wants to be with him. Otherwise, he's far off. Far off from the divine presence, far off from his scriptures. Now the fourth step. John is in the courtyard of Annas and Caiaphas. How John got into this courtyard of the high priest, we do not know. Maybe the Zebedee Fishing Company supplied fish for the high priest. Maybe. But at any rate, John was well known, and he was inside, and he let Peter in. So you see, Peter had just enough of the Lord to, well, to find out what's going on. It's a cold night, a March night. And in the beautiful descriptive language of the gospel, Peter warmed himself by the fire. Baby, it's cold outside. After we neglect prayer, after we substitute action, after we follow the Lord far off, there comes the fourth stage of creature comforts. We mustn't work too hard. We might hurt our health. Take it easy. Get your rest. The people are making too many demands. After all, I can't afford to break down my health. We warm ourselves by the fire. And the fifth and final stage of the loss. He picks up a few girlfriends. Three of them. And as he is standing alongside of this fire, that ruddy face of his they can pick out as Galilean. He certainly did not come from the right side of the tracks. He was no Judean. Why was he there anyway? So he talks to one and then the other and finally the third and Perhaps he's rather anxious to win their favor. So one of them goes a little bit too far, and she says, Well, haven't you been to the Galilee? And he says, I don't know the man. The man. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I don't know the man. And thus the five stages, neglect of prayer, substitution of action, following the Lord far off, creature comforts, creature friends. And this is the barometer, these five grades. And we can ask ourselves at any moment, at which point am I? 
in my priestly relationship to Christ. But whatever point it is, we are not hopeless. If there were five steps in the fall, there are three in the return. The first step in the return was the crowing of the cock. He had told our blessed Lord the night of the Last Supper that though everyone else denied him, he would not. And our blessed Lord said that before the crowing of the cock, he would deny him three times. And there was the crowing of a cock. Now, there were different hours at which the soldiers posted themselves for the watch. Nine to twelve midnight, and twelve to three, and three to six. Three to six was called the Galicinium, the cock crow. There might have been a cock crowing at that time, or it might have been the Galicinium of the Roman army. It doesn't make a particle of difference. The return of Peter comes by a reminder from the natural order of what he ought to be. The Lord had warned him. Now the warning comes home to him. And so with the priest. Maybe it's the finding of a breviary that he hasn't used in some time. Maybe a first mass card. Maybe some layman says, well, weren't you at such and such a parish, such and such a year? These are all the crowings of the cock. The good Lord pulling us back. And the second stage, though that comes from nature and outside of ourselves, except just to remind us, the next step is from the Lord. This, I think, is one of the most beautiful scenes in the Gospel. Our Lord was in the courtroom of Annas and Caiaphas. Peter is here warming himself by a fire. Now, when that door opens and the Lord comes out of the door, and Peter's standing here talking to these ladies, what do you suppose he did? Well, he did what I would do in similar circumstances. I wouldn't want to see the Lord. And neither did Peter. So Peter turned his back. There are moments when we just can't stand Christ. There will be some who will say, I will make a retreat provided you don't talk about Christ. Not about Christ. So he turns his back. And the Lord then comes from behind. And as the Volga put it, conversus dominus, the Lord turned. So he was facing Peter. Judas got his lips. Peter got his eyes. The Lord turned. That's how much the Lord loves us. He turns to us. We turn from him. He does not. He wants us to be his own always. And the third step. He went out and wept bitterly. Conversion and penitence. These are the gradations of our falling away and the gradations of our returning again to the Lord. And just read over the epistles of Peter and you will see how much he comes to the cross and resurrection and that we are saved only by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed not by gold and silver, but only by the blood of Christ. So Peter is now back. 
And our scene shifts to the Sunday after Easter. Early morning. Peter had said to six others, I'm going fishing. This is in the imperfect tense in the original gospel, indicating a continuing action. Peter goes back to the fishing business. Let's face it. Do you remember when we had to read a second nocturne in the office? We had a second nocturne of St. Gregory who said it was all right for Peter to go back to fishing because there was not much money in it. Now, with all due credit to St. Gregory, that does not take account of the facts. Now, Peter was not convinced of the resurrection of Christ. So he goes back into fishing, and he must have been a natural leader, because when he said to Nathaniel and James and Andrew, two other disciples, I'm going fishing, he said, all right, we'll go with you. So he's back in the fishing business. Our Lord has called him to be fishers of men. Now he's a fisher of fish. He's a hundred yards out in the sea. And the risen Lord, in the early morning mist, is standing alongside of a rock which is still there. And in between are two rocks, in between red and burnt fish. And our Lord asks them if they had caught anything. And John said, It's the Lord. And Peter, who had been naked, throws something about him, dives into the sea, and comes to our blessed Lord, so anxious to see him. But, a few verses later in John, what do we find? That Peter is out in the boat again, dragging in a net of 153 fishes. They counted them that day. Why, if Peter was so anxious to see our Lord, did he go out to the boat? Because of the fire. When Peter stood aside those flames, he recalled ten nights before. And those flames to him were like the very flames of hell. And he could not possibly endure them. And so he dove into the sea. And then when he came back, Our Lord asked him three questions. Our Lord never said to him, I told you. He never says that. He need not tell us, I told you. We know it. We do not need even divinity to remind us. And when we come back, he just asks us certain questions. Do you love me? That's all. Do you love me? And in answer of Peter, there was given the different commissions, which we know. But because we have only one word in English for love, we do not get the full flavor of what is happening. So we will take the Greek word philine and then the Greek word agapine, Translate philine, do you love me in a natural, human, brotherly kind of way? The agapine, do you love me with a totally committed, sacrificial victim of love? So our Lord begins. Simon, son of John, with the weak human nature he's talking to, Simon, son of John, do you love me in a divine, sacrificial, victimal, totally committed kind of way? And poor Simon Peter is not going out on any more limbs. He had promised too much once. And he said, Lord, you know that I love you in a human, natural, brotherly kind of way. The second time... Simon, son of John, do you love me in a divine, victimal, 
sacrificial kind of way. Lord, you know that I love you in a human, natural kind of way. The third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me in a human, natural kind of way? And Peter was sad. Maybe because the Lord had not asked him for the total love. Maybe because he seemed to doubt what Peter was saying. But in any case, the Lord will take the little poor love that we have. And he reaches his arms down under us to lift us up as he did with Simon. And this is the story of the restored man. Our model, our example. There are over 250 pontiffs reaching back to Simon. They are links in a great pontifical chain. No chain is stronger than its weakest link. And the weakest link of all of the chains was the first. And that weak link was held in the hands of Christ. And that is why the papacy will never fall. And when our blessed Lord gathered his apostles around him on one occasion, he said, Satan would sift you as wheat. You twelve, Satan would sift you as wheat. And this is something we lose by substituting the word you for thou. I've always shrunk from it in a certain way. I think that in these days of equalizing everything, that we should at least have kept one personal pronoun for divinity. But our Lord said, Satan would sift you, twelve, as wheat. I have prayed for you. No. That's not what the gospel says. Did our Lord pray for the twelve? No. I have prayed for thee, for Peter. So that after you have recovered from your fall, you will strengthen your brethren. Each and every one of us wants to be in that prayer of Christ. We share in that prayer of Christ only in as much as we are united to Peter. The Lord prayed for him in the conflict with Satan. And in that prayer for him, the church is strengthened. This is extremely important in this day, to trust in the prayer of Christ for Peter. He did not make John the head of his church because John was too strong. He could never help us poor mortals. But he chose Peter so that the church would always understand human weakness and frailty falling away, the neglect of prayer, and the like. And then the hope that there might be a return. This is the man on whom the church was founded, the man that we are like. And Peter, in the course of his life, 
had occasion many times to recall the incidents of the three years of the public life. And in his epistle, he mentions only one explicit incident. And that was the transfiguration. But as he went through life, tradition has it that he wept so much that the tears furrowed his cheeks. He carried with him into the grave one profound, terrible remorse. He would have loved a thousand times to have undone it. And may that remorse never be ours. And that great pity that Peter had was that he never answered the question of our Lord. Could you not stay awake one hour? <laughs>